Over its eight-year history, 280,000 prisoners were confined in Buchenwald concentration camp. 60,000 of those would die there, around a quarter of which perished in the closing months of the war, when the camp's evacuation turned into a death march. Buchenwald wasn't a mass extermination camp, didn't possess gas chambers, like, say, at Auschwitz. It did have ovens where those that succumbed to the harsh treatment were cremated. They ran virtually 24-7, and the stench was such anyone who smelt it would never forget it. Soviet prisoners, press gang poles, political dissidents, internal and external undesirable, as well as Jews, were literally worked to death in the camp's armament factories. Those that could no longer work were shot or hung, children included. Citizens of 30 nations ended up in the spy word for inhumanity. Two of those were New Zealanders. This is the stories of Flight Lieutenant Malcolm Cullen and Squadron Leader Philip Lamison. Their backgrounds, how they ended up in Buchenwald and their time there. Cullen grew up on a farm in North Auckland, trained as a pilot with the RAF in Canada in late 1942. When he ended up in England, he was immediately in the thick of it, flying his typhoon over Europe on what were essentially strafing missions. On May 24, 1944, he was shot down over France and was taken in by the French resistance. By July, the Allied landings had taken place and Cullen's plan was to navigate his way from his hideout in Paris back to the advancing Allies. He would never get that opportunity. The Germans had a mole in the French underground and he and a bunch of American airmen were betrayed and after 21 days on the run, he was arrested by the Gestapo. Shoved first into a civilian prison, then found himself on one of the cattle trucks along with approximately 70 other odd downed airmen bound for Buchenwald near Leipzig. Not that the Germans told them where they were destined for, of course. After the war, Cullen believed the only reason they ended up in Buchenwald was due to the collapse of Nazi Germany and their ability to house any new prisoners of war. That combined with a growing contempt of German citizens as a whole towards airmen. Those very airmen that had laid waste to city after city, day and night. Lamison was from Napier and he had some civilian flight experience before becoming a pilot with 218 Squadron RAF. His flying career was a stellar one. Received numerous awards including the Distinguished Flying Cross in May 1942 and that had a bar added to it in June of 1944 whilst he was on the run in France. The last award was presented to him after the war by King George at Buckingham Palace. At the time his Lancaster was shot down by a night fighter over France with him at the controls on the 8th of June 1944. Lamison had risen to the rank of squadron leader. All of the crew, bar one, managed to parachute to safety, and like Cullen, were secreted away by the resistance in small groups. His plan, along with that of his navigator, was to move from safe house to safe house to get to neutral Spain. Those plans would never come to fruition. He met the same fate as Cullen. Betrayed by a French double agent, he too ended up being captured by the Gestapo, imprisoned as a civilian, and then in a boxcar full of other airmen, with SS guards in tow. Destination, Buchenwald. There was never a good time for anyone to enter Buchenwald. Walk through the iron gates bearing the words, Yedem dash Zeiner, loosely to each his own. On the 20th of August 1944, 168 Allied airmen entered Buchenwald concentration camp. A few days later, 
Paris would fall. Romania had just switched sides. An entire army was encircled by the Russians in Courland. Starved of resources and manpower, even the most ardent Nazi knew the end game was being played out. Many of those, though, were willing to go down in the flames. Take whoever with them. The situation facing the airmen was made grimmer because the regime was crumbling. In their ranks there were They were alone. Survival depended on their own wits, preserving military discipline. The person to lead them was the highest ranking prisoner, squadron leader Philip Lamerson. His first task was to make it clear to the camp commandant, Hermann Pista, that they were military personnel and should be in a prisoner of war camp. Pista, who would later die of a heart attack shortly before he was due to be hung after the war, acknowledged their status, but said he couldn't do anything. The airmen had their scalps shaved, boots taken, and dressed in the standard camp garb. They were to be treated like everyone else in the hellhole. Lived on a quarter of a loaf of bread, half a litre of watery soup, and a cup of coffee per day. The only thing they were to be spared was work detail. Left to their own devices, it was about to get even worse. Information had been leaked to the Allies. The factories at Buchenwald were manufacturing components for V-2 rockets. Just four days after their arrival, around midday, a formation of B-17s were overhead. Their mission was to destroy the factories and spare as many prisoners' lives as possible. Those photographs in front of you, by the way, are real. 500 pound bombs and incendiaries rained down on the camp. It was every man and child for himself. The guards ran to the air raid shelters. Everyone else threw themselves on the ground and prayed the aimer, 4,000 metres above them, was having a good day. In a feat of precision bombing that lasted 15 minutes, the munitions factories, railway sidings and guard quarters were obliterated. Collateral damage was inevitable. Factory workers were the main casualties. Several of the air crew were wounded. Miraculously, no one amongst their midst died. This raid made the airmen's situation even more precarious. The SS guards sought reprisals. Amongst the targets of the bombing were not just the guard quarters inside the camp, their houses outside the wire were between the B-17's crosshairs. Wives and children of the SS guards had been killed and wounded by the 615th Squadron. They wanted to kill the airmen in an act of revenge. The first few weeks the airmen had no shelter as such, not even blankets. Only got access to an already overcrowded hut in the third week. These prefabricated huts were originally made for horses. Under Lamerson's leadership the airmen maintained military discipline, held parades, posted sentries, marched in unison distinguished themselves as a military grouping, did what they could to survive, knowing at any moment the SS could move in at the slightest provocation. By week eight, the first of two airmen to die succumbed to pneumonia. Rescue would come from an unlikely source, a Luftwaffe air ace with 58 confirmed kills to his name. Just quickly, a reminder on the subject of Kiwi POWs in World War II. I've done a video on the only two New Zealanders to escape Japanese captivity. There's a link in the description. Now on with the story. The highly decorated Throutloft was the inspector of day fighters for the whole entire Luftwaffe. Rumours had been bandied about his Berlin HQ, 
that there were a bunch of Allied airmen held by the SS in Buchenwald. Using the excuse of inspecting the camp after the raid, Trautloth drove 300 kilometres to the camp along with an adjutant who spoke English. None the wiser the guards took the two around the camp to inspect the damage. At the end of the inspection, Trautloff was yelled out by one of the Allied prisoners, US crewman Bernard Schaft. That name is a bit of a giveaway, and Schaft's parents were German. The guards naturally weren't too keen for any of the aircrew to speak to anyone outside the barbed wire. The six foot three inch Trautloft overruled them and ordered to speak to the commanding officer. A 15 minute meeting then took place between Lamerson and Troutloft via a translator. And since at the treatment of the aircrew, Troutloft began a process of getting them transferred to a POW camp by slapping the file on Hermann Göring's desk. On the 19th of October, seven days after the Luftwaffe inspection, 11 weeks after they were first incarcerated, 166 of the original 168 airmen began their journey to the relative luxury of Stalag Luft III in what is now Poland. If that camp name sounds familiar to you, it was the site of the Great Escape. And the prisoners there were truly shocked to see the condition of the shaven-headed airmen. Lamerson had lost 20 kilos through the ordeal. It wouldn't be his last. As the Russians closed in on Berlin in mid-January 1945, all the prisoners were force-marched in the middle of winter into what was left of the Reich. They were ultimately freed by the Russians three weeks before Germany surrendered. What happened to Cullen and Lamerson at war's end? They both went back to life on the farm, published books about the experiences in the camp. Cullen died in 2002 at the age of 83. Lamerson in 2012 aged 93. Please bear in mind this is just the stories of the two Kiwis in Buchenwald. There are plenty of other harrowing recollections from their fellow prisoners to check out as well. To grow this channel and plonk forgotten New Zealand history like this in front of more eyeballs, please like and subscribe. Also, don't forget to have a geese at the remarkable story of the two Kiwis that survived their escapes from Japanese captivity. See you next time.